Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So today I am speaking with Michael Greenberg, who is the chairman of the neurobiology department at Harvard and a postdoc in his lab, Dan Ebert. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg, Dr. Ebert, for joining us today. It's I thought we would... Happy to be here. Um, we're speaking today because you have a paper that's coming out in Nature uh, this Sunday. And um, getting a paper in Nature is certainly a, um, a very big achievement. So congratulations to you both. Thank you. Thank and you. And we're going to speak a little bit about the paper. But before we get started, I thought you could take a couple of minutes to just um, give us a little bit of uh, your background. Dr. Greenberg? Well, my background is that I was born in Miami Beach, Florida. And, uh, <laughs> Maybe not that far back. <laughs> yep, I won't go too far back. I was uh, educated in New York, and uh, uh, I've been at Harvard Medical School since 1986, running a laboratory uh, that studies the basic mechanisms um, by which uh, uh, experience, sensory experience, uh, uh, promotes the development of the uh, brain that underlies uh, learning, memory, and behavior. And uh, a number of years ago, in our efforts to understand how sensory experience turns on programs of gene expression in the brain that underlie various aspects of uh, growth and maturation of the connections in the brain, we came upon um, this protein MECP2 that's mutated in Rett syndrome and began to try to understand its basic function and then what goes wrong in Rett syndrome. Thank you. I'm a uh, physician scientist, an MD, PhD, and uh, I'm a psychiatrist at the Mass General Hospital. And since finishing my psychiatry training, I've been uh, pursuing mentored research training uh, in Mike Greenberg's laboratory uh, with the idea of trying to uh, advance our understanding of the molecular mechanisms of these neuropsychiatric disorders. I think having that dual background is um, a really, you know, brings probably gives you a very unique perspective, so it's great. Okay, so let's dig into the, the paper, and um, I'm going to ask you in, in as layman uh, terms as possible to, to give us the highlights, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, I think uh, Mike and I have uh, had this hypothesis that we think that Perhaps one of the things that may be wrong in Rett syndrome is that there may be some dysregulation of how, uh, how a neuron, when it becomes active, uh, leads to a signaling cascade uh, within the neuron. And we think that this process of, uh, this, of how a neuron responds to experience and responds to activity uh, may be dysregulated uh, in this disorder. And so we... Uh, uh, pursue this hypothesis uh, through various mechanisms. So, so uh, can, another can way... You, can you just give us an example? I, I want to make sure people are clear. So when you say you respond to an activity, can you give us examples of what that might mean? So, so let, me, um, let me interject here. Um, at about, um, you know, from birth into the first uh, uh, few years of life, there's an exuberant period of um, sensory-driven um, learning, uh, which can be uh, uh, categorized as critical periods when um, an infant learns to walk and talk and uh, also uh, uh, ultimately learns to read and write. And this is uh, uh, due to the um, interaction of sensory input um, input from the environment um, impinging on the um, on the genome, the the DNA, the genes. Um, in neurons. And, and the way this works, we have found, is that uh, sensory input leads to the release of neurotransmitters in the brain, and those neurotransmitters set in motion a chain of events that lead to the turn on of genes that orchestrate uh, the uh, maturation and um, uh, refinement of the connections in the brain. A good example of these, uh, what happens in these critical periods is of, of learning is that uh, initially uh, many, many uh, synapses, connections in the brain are formed in some of the circuits in the brain. Um, uh, approximately 90% of them get pruned away during um, the periods of uh, critical periods for learning. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
we're interested in what are the actual cellular uh, control mechanisms that allow for pruning. And uh, some work in the laboratory suggests that these processes of the maturation of the connections in the brain, their pruning, the balance of the excitatory uh, uh, aspect of brain function with the inhibitory brain function requires um, uh, is, is uh, put in place through um, input from the environment. And we have evidence from our work over the last 10 years that MECP2, the protein that's mutated in Rett syndrome, plays a key role in that process. And this paper is um, uh, aimed at trying to understand MECP2's role in experience-dependent um, uh, synapse or uh, development in brain development and what might go wrong in Rett syndrome. And the fact that the girls have a seemingly normal period of development and then begin to regress could we think, play, you know, yes. could be a, the, the effect of... of yes, right. exactly. I think the work that um, Dan has been doing is really aimed at that specific aspect of Rett syndrome, the fact that at, at birth um, and through the first year of life, uh, the girls um, appear uh, relatively normal. They learn to walk and they learn their first words. And just as uh, sensory input this um, um, is, is sending signals in the brain that lead to the maturation of um, uh, connections in the brain, uh, that's when um, Rett syndrome ensues. So the hypothesis was that maybe MECP2 is is playing an important role in this in these critical periods for learning um, and that um, if we could understand what its role is perhaps we might ultimately uh, have some success in developing therapies for treating Rett syndrome. Okay, so Dan can you can you tell us what your key findings were? So what we did to in order to understand better how MECB2 may be functioning in this pathway of how a neuron responds to activity or experience was we uh, sought to identify and define how MECB2, the protein, gets modified uh, in response to experience or activity. And we one way that proteins can get uh, modified in response to experience is through a process called phosphorylation, uh, which is essentially you have a protein and a tag gets put onto it. And so we sought to identify what those tags were and what functional consequence they had. And so we uh, identified multiple uh, sites of phosphorylation where these tags get added uh, in MECP2 in response to neuronal activity. And then we uh, focused on one of the phosphorylation events uh, to really try to understand how it worked uh, in neurons in the brain. And what we discovered was this uh, one particular phosphorylation at a, uh, uh, a site on the protein called threonine 308 that uh, the tag that gets placed there, the phosphorylation that gets placed there, what it uh, does is that it regulates an interaction with another protein. Uh, one of the common things that a, what these tags or phosphorylation events can do is that they can either create or disrupt binding with other proteins uh, within a cell. And so what we discovered was that this particular phosphorylation uh, 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 disrupts an interaction with this uh, NCOR co-repressor complex, uh, which is, uh, a, uh, seems to be a critical interactor with MECP2, as uh, Adrian Bird's uh, group in the companion paper uh, discovered. And uh, what we found was that this interaction with this co-repressor is very dynamically re regulated in response to activity or to experience. And what these co-repressors do is that they uh, help regulate how other genes uh, in the DNA are, uh, are, are turned on or turned off. Well, I, I think one thing to keep in mind about this, this work is that it first started about 10 years ago with the discovery that MECP2 is somehow modified by um, in response to sensory experience. And this happens in all our brains in response to um, our interaction in the environment that MECP2 gets modified. And the, 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 we, we knew that was true 10 years ago. And the key to understanding what actually is happening and how it affects MECP2's 
function is to identify the site on the amino acid chain, which amino acids are modified. And um, in several papers over the years, we were able to identify a, a particular site at, at one end of MECB2 that gets modified. And it turns out that despite a, a really um, lot of hard work in the lab over these 10 years, we were not able to figure out how sensory input through neurotransmitter release and this modification, this one amino acid um, called serine 421, how it actually affected um, MECP2 function. So we've been we've been uh, grappling with this problem for 10 years. And what Dan's um, experiments do, Dan, Dr. Ebert, um, <laughs> do is to uh, is to take another look at this. And instead of having just one place where it's modified, he now has increased the number of places it gets modified to about four, and that's given a, a foothold in understanding how um, the modifications of MECP2 in response to experience um, can affect um, uh, ne neuronal development and brain development. Now, it turns out that uh, what this paper also shows is that it's quite um, complex the way MECP2 responds to the environment. We're just... Um, um, have identified the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to learn, and it's it's a fascinating subject. It also, I think, holds great potential um, uh, for the development of therapies for treating Rett syndrome because this is a it's a protein that, when mutated, causes Rett syndrome. We need to understand its normal function, what it does, and this represents an important step in understanding just how it works in the neuron. And that is a key uh, step towards understanding what goes wrong in Rett syndrome. Right. So MECP2 is found everywhere in the body, and yet Rett syndrome is primarily a neurological disorder. Does the phosphorylation aspect of that, you think, play a role in that aspect? Uh, so in neurons, it's expressed at very high levels, uh, much more than other parts of the body. Uh, suggesting that it perhaps it has some special role in neurons. Uh, and uh, neurons uh, are, are particularly responsive to uh, various environmental stimuli, particularly these activity-dependent pathways. And, uh, and so that may be a reason why it's primarily a neurologic disorder. I think the other thing to say is that uh, we think, at least in early experiments, that the modification that was identified early on was was highly specific to neurons and it stands to reason Dan hasn't looked at this in great detail but it seems as though these other these new modifications of MECP2 may also be um, specific to the brain we have more to do to be sure but certainly it, they, they're happening in the neurons where MECP2 is expressed at these high levels and, and one idea is that MECP2 has a a, a specific a selective function in in neurons that um, is uh, is special to neurons, and we'd like to understand what that is. Now, we think that special function is that it serves as a as a um, way of allowing the neurons to sense a change in its environment, the release of neurotransmitter, and then convert that into um, a genomic response, allowing the genome to uh, to uh, uh, dictate uh, the neuron's response to its environment. So you could look at it as uh, uh, a, a point of uh, contact between the inside of the cell with its environment. It's mm -hmm. sort of the way that um, uh, uh, the genes interact with the environment, maybe through MECP2, and when that's um, disrupted, you, 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 you get Rett syndrome. Another way to look at this is um, to think about nature versus nurture. Everybody's heard about that. In terms of nature, what we're really referring to is the genes, that um, aspects of our um, uh, brain function are, are embedded within our genes. The nurture part is um, the environment. A mother um, can impact on their child in the way the way the um, external environment sends a signal in a neuron is through neurotransmitter release mm -hmm. and then at least in part through a modification of MECP2. So if MECP2 isn't, isn't, um, isn't there, then the nature-nurture signal 
is disrupted and um, and the result might be our wet syndrome. Okay, that's interesting. There was a sentence in your paper that um, intrigued me, and I think this is what you're referring to here, but you say MECP2 may, f may function as an epigenetic regulator of gene expression that integrates diverse signals from the environment. I mean, you can imagine, you know, we're exposed to so many uh, signals from the environment. Uh, so c can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so what we discovered in the paper was that these uh, multiple modifications of MECB2 that we identified, that, they're, uh, that they get placed onto MECB2 in response differentially depending on what the signal is coming in from the environment. Uh, suggesting that different uh, signaling cascades, different experiences would differentially uh, modify MECB2. And perhaps MECB2 sitting uh, in the nucleus uh, of a neuron could integrate those different signals coming in to then have the, the genomic response uh, read it out. And, and just to speak about this whole issue of epigenetics, it's you hear a lot about it in the news. What it basically is referring to is the idea that um, who we are is determined by our genes, the DNA, but then there can be environmental influence um, that can modify the DNA and affect its function. That can be referred to as epigenetics. And, and MECP2, in a sense, is a, is a control point for epigenetics by binding to DNA it, in particular places, it allows the DNA um, function to be modified. And, and the idea that in, in this, this uh, New Nature paper is uh, uh, essentially uh, deciphering part of the, this epigenetic code, just how MECP2 contributes um, to uh, uh, how the, the way in which the environment um, uh, can send signals to modify uh, a protein and perhaps the uh, associated with DNA and perhaps the DNA itself. So y you touched on this before in terms of how could this treatment uh, play a role in, down the road in, in, in potentially helping with you know with a therapeutic. Um, can you can you elaborate on that just a little bit? I mean, this is a basic science discovery, obviously, but it stands to reason that if we understand what MECP2 does, um, that, you know, we, we would gain some insight into how to, how to design uh, a, a treatment specific for Rett syndrome. But could you give us perhaps some insight into, you know, some specifics about how that might happen? I think one of the uh, hopeful and encouraging things about Rett syndrome is the uh, series of papers that came out a few years ago, one of which from Adrian Bird's lab suggesting that, uh, that, uh, that, that there are, are key aspects of this disorder that can be treatable. Right. And uh, Adrian Bird's paper a few years ago did this in a genetic way. But what one uh, uh, avenue for effective therapeutics would be to develop a small molecule, a, a, a drug, um, that would uh, uh, provide benefit. But in order to sort of rationally design a reasonable uh, drug or small molecule is you have to understand uh, how MECB2 is actually functioning in a brain. And what, what we think we are uh, starting to discover with this basic science paper is that uh, MECB2 plays a really key role in this pathway of, of how sensory experience and activity uh, sh uh, leads to changes in gene expression that then shapes how a neuron responds to the environment. And so as we define this pathway, it uh, provides a potential avenue for developing therapeutics that would target this particular pathway, perhaps in some way to bypass the absence of MECB2 in individuals where there's a loss of MECB2. Um, and, and so that, that would be the, the vision. So just to add a little bit to that, I, I, I would say a f make a few general comments and then one specific one. Obviously, um, we would like to find a therapy for Rett syndrome as soon as possible. And one might imagine a variety of ways forward that could be fruitful. And often one might think that 
a, a basic science approach is the slowest way towards uh, a therapy. But it turns out that in some cases, uh, what seems like the, the, the slow route turns out to be the fast route. I think if you think about it in the following way, that if you um, uh, use a computer and we're, we're talking over a computer and the computer breaks and you want to fix it, what you would try to do, even with an apple, is open it up and understand how it works. And you probably acknowledge that if you don't understand how a computer works, it's very unlikely that you would be able to fix it. Right. So what we're trying to do is to understand how MECP2 works. And this is um, a, a major step forward for understanding how MECP2 works in the neuron. So put in simple ways, what um, the two papers that have are coming out, um, just come out, are, are saying is that MECP2 works through this other um, uh, interaction with a, with a protein called NCOR. And we now know something about the nature of that interaction. And it's disrupted in Rett syndrome. Now, if we could come up with a, a therapy that bridges that interaction, um, that could be very useful. Now, there are ways we can imagine such a therapy now. And without knowing that interaction, we couldn't even begin to um, think about it. About it. So it's an important step forward because we know of a new interaction that's clearly important for function. We know it's disrupted in Rett syndrome, and now the way forward might be to imagine a therapeutic that could bridge the interaction that's not occurring in some individuals with Rett syndrome. Right. And I, you know, from from my perspective as a as a parent of a child with Rett syndrome who interacts with a lot of other families, and but but also as someone who runs an organization that funds research. You know, I think it's important for us to pursue treatment strategies in parallel, things like gene therapy, activating the silent MECP2 protein replacement, so on and so forth, in parallel with the basic yes. science. We don't know which one's going to work out first, and you could come up with a finding that changes changes everything overnight. Well, maybe not overnight, but so yep. I think it's important to have the resources to be able to pursue these things in parallel. Um, because you know you, you may inform other strategies down the road. So. I heartily agree, and I think one other thing that's coming out from this research is the suggestion that not um, all Rett syndrome is the same. Mm -hmm. That that a mutation at one end of the protein is is working in a different way than a mutation at the other end of the protein. And by understanding what each mutation is doing, it offers um, new ways in or um, t for thinking about possible thera therapeutics. The therapeutic for a mutation um, in the DNA binding domain might be different than a therapeutic that is aimed at correcting the um, uh, dis mutation that disrupts the interaction with NCOR. That said, a value of, of some um, uh, approaches such as gene therapy is that they may encompass yeah. all of the... Um, yeah, they'd be more generic. It's more generic. But yeah. we, we, we need to, I think, for sure, um, uh, take multiple approaches. Um, and uh, the basic science approach is one, one way, and I think it offers a lot of promise. It may seem as though it's far away in the distance, but discovery can, um, can um, change the, uh, exactly. the, the prospects. Well, and, and science uh, is not linear. Uh, yes. Right, so... Um, so you've alluded to um, Adrian Bird's lab and co collaborations. Uh, these two papers came out, out uh, from an effort um, that RSRT has funded um, for the last couple of years, the MECP2 Consortium, um, which brings three labs, yourself, Adrian Bird's lab, and Gail Mandel um, from Oregon, um, t to work in a collaborative fashion. Do you want to say a few words about that collaboration? How about if I start with that? Um, Monica, I'm just telling you something you already know, but this is for the uh, um, uh, purpose of letting all the listeners know. Um, I guess four years ago, I um, approached you with the idea of a consortium of uh, bringing together some of the best labs working on, on MECP2 and Rett syndrome to work together. And my thinking was that um, that uh, an understanding of MECP2, unfortunately, um, is extremely challenging. This is a very difficult protein to work with. And, and I suggested that it wasn't um, 
moving forward fast enough and that if we were going to make progress, what we really needed to do was to bring um, the best minds together to synergize, to understand how this protein works so that when we, when we know that, we can um, perhaps uh, uh, think um, uh, up rational therapeutics. So you were convinced and um, we're pleased to uh, uh, support this uh, research through the Rett Syndrome Research Trust. And um, it's allowed us to come together on a regular basis to uh, put our heads together to think about MECP2 function and also think about therapies for RET. And the result has been, in my mind, um, really, uh, really um, exciting and um, uh, encouraging insofar as we now see um, the publication of two major papers um, that have given new insight into MECP2 function and Tourette syndrome. These papers are the result of a very significant collaboration. They would not have occurred if um, uh, uh, the Mandel lab, the Bird lab, and the Greenberg lab had not been getting together on a regular basis together with Monica to um, investigate um, MECP2 function and think about Rett syndrome. So this is an example of synergy, I think, when we look back at this um, 10 years from now, we will see these papers as milestones in advancing our understanding of Rett syndrome. The, for someone at the bench, the consortium has uh, vastly accelerated the progress. And being able to work closely with uh, on these particular manuscripts with uh, Adrian's lab uh, it has just accelerated both the lab's uh, progress on this particular topic. I think um, one thing that's not appreciated by a lay person is that scientists don't all think alike. Uh, uh, science is a creative uh, process which requires your imagination as well as your intellect and your analytical ability. And, and scientists who um, work in their individual laboratories um, are able to make progress uh, um, and, and sometimes very rapid progress. But when a problem is particularly difficult, it's really... Uh, very useful to get um, uh, three scientists together to think together because scientists thinking differently about a problem coming together can come up with a solution that um, might never come if you um, were just to uh, uh, sit alone in your office or together with your lab mates thinking about uh, uh, the, uh, the how to solve the problem in your in your typical way. I think it's the the mixing of, of different approaches and ways of thinking that's allowed um, through this consortium that's allowed us to make uh, very rapid progress. It also has resulted in um, a sharing of results at a very early stage. There were work, there were experiments going on in, in the bird laboratory that um, under normal circumstances we wouldn't have heard about for about three years. We heard about them three years early. Even knowing them, um, uh, uh, we still had a lot of work to do, but, but knowing about their preliminary work early and their knowing about our work early has brought um, these papers to fruition probably um, several years before they, it, they would have um, been seen by, by the world. That, of course, advances the field overall because if the, if the papers are, are important and they're, they represent a significant advance now, that advance is available to the entire uh, science community, um, perhaps two years earlier than it would have been. That's, that a, can be a, yeah, that's a huge, impact. important point that really can't be underestimated, I think. Um, so, Mike, if, I guess maybe three years ago or so, you, you said to me that the MECP2 protein was one of the most challenging molecules you had ever worked on. And I'm curious whether you still feel that way. Uh, or whether perhaps things are getting a little bit more clear? Well, I guess I would say um, MECP2 is a very challenging protein. It's, 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 been, it's, been, it's been very hard to understand, and I think it's still true that it's a very challenging problem, but it's definitely become clearer um, through this work. And I think that um, when we started this about 10 years ago, I thought the initial discoveries were really... Uh, leading us in a, in a positive direction. And then what we found ourselves doing is slogging through the mud. It just turned out to be exceedingly difficult. And I would say 
at the time that I approached you about the consortium, I was at my low point in terms of um, thinking about uh, what MECP2 did, was doing. I, I felt we hit a wall on that. And um, I think through the consortium, the, the um, combined effort of, of the Mandel, Bird, and Greenberg laboratories, we have made a very important advance that's described in this paper, not just in terms of the NCOR interaction, but these modifications of MECP2. So I would say that while MECP2 still presents a challenge to us that's very significant, I do see um, many rays of light in terms of moving forward. I'm very excited about it. I think that uh, we can um, expect to see a lot of progress. Now, one of the things that's... Um, exciting about MECP2 to a basic scientist is while it's very challenging, the most challenging um, problems offer the uh, uh, often the greatest potential for really um, important um, breakthrough discoveries. I think that's true for MECP2. I think that through the basic science we can expect in the next um, few years, certainly over the next decade, really some breakthrough discoveries that will uh, really allow us to appreciate epigenetics in the brain and um, will have a major impact in our ability to uh, think thoughtfully about therapies for Rett syndrome. Well, I, I know that the families that are listening are certainly hoping that uh, within the decade we may have something that's going to help these girls. I know I, I certainly hope that. Um, we do too. Yeah. Dan, do you have anything to add? Uh, just that it's been uh, the the opportunities to work in the consortium have been really fabulous in order to, uh, the, the other thing we haven't said about the consortium is that it's actually greatly aided the training of young scientists. Uh, so, uh, from both of the three laboratories, uh, the young scientists in training, have had a very rich, uh, opportunity to, to, uh, train with, with all three, uh, uh, senior, uh, scientists and, uh, as, for me personally, has greatly advanced uh, my personal development and future career as a physician scientist studying these disorders. An important aspect of that to keep in mind is that uh, funding in this way through a consortium that that um, helps with the training of young scientists really gets leveraged because their success means that each one will go off and start a lab of their own that will be dedicated to uh, uh, the study of Rett syndrome. So I'm very excited about that. Certainly, Is that the plan, Dan? That's the plan. <laughs> okay. Just need to get hired. <laughs> if anyone out there has a job, <laughs> Dan, are, that would be Are great. you looking right now? Just starting. Okay. All right. Well, maybe we will broadcast this video far and wide. I don't think you'll have a problem, Dan. Um, um, thank you both very much for taking the time to discuss the paper and the highlights. And... Um, you know, we look forward to continued discoveries from the consortium and um, to hopefully getting closer to, to treatments. Thank you very, very much. Thank you Thank very you. much.